Welcome to Night Clerk Radio, episode 10, Hauntology. We're going to be looking at some of the philosophical, theoretical framework uh, in which uh, to explain why is Vaporwave? Why do we like it so much? What is appealing about it? And why this particular aesthetic? Of course, with me is my co-host, Burke. Hey. How you doing, Burke? I'm good. I'm excited because, you know, this is our second topic episode. We previously discussed Plunder Phonics. Mm. And as I was thinking about this episode, while Plunder Phonics is probably more air quotes important to Vaporwave, I definitely think ontology is the more interesting topic of the two, personally. Yeah, I mean, I agree because Plunder Phonics explains sort of the how, how was it made? Like what the sort of like production techniques and like why uh and also why the why it works for vaporway the but like hauntology is sort of explaining why did this music of uh, genre of music come to be it turns out it's it's actually pretty obvious if you think about it i don't know at least at least to me it seems like oh yeah that makes a lot of sense Mm -hmm. the more i think about it so i guess we should start with at the beginning of like what is ontology probably good you probably did a little more writing, a little more show notes on this end than I did. <laughs> so, oh, no. Think that, yeah. Sure. Yeah. So hauntology is a term coined by Derrida in 93 in his book Spectres of Marx, where everybody had kind of gone all end of history, Fukuyama, after the fall of the Soviet Union. And Derrida was very interested in how we connected with our memories, how we can feel disjointed from our own past, either one we lived in or didn't and have only heard about. Mm -hmm. So he sort of coined this term, um, specifically the haunt and hauntology was referencing Marx because it was like, well, Marx died a century ago and everyone in Europe is still obsessed with him. Mm -hmm. These ideas on either side just won't go away. But then I think, you know, sort of languished for a while, um, but was really revived in the 2000s by music critics like Simon Reynolds and Mark Fisher, Mm -hmm. who used it to refer to a specific kind of music coming out of the UK. And they really talked about how this music, so clearly tied to Vaporwave, is much more about invoking like cultural memory or identity through our media consumption. And that branched out into all these bands. So they were really focused on this UK label, Ghostbox, which I actually didn't look to see if it's still around. But they wrote about that a lot. And there were other bands like Bazinski and The Caretaker. I think you want to get into Little Boards of Canada, so we can talk about them later. And they just really looked at how these music genres produced meaning through their aesthetic, how they were actually produced in studio, and, and what they're trying to do with their audience. So that's really where we're headed today. Mm-hmm. Uh, by the way, Ghost Box is still around. At least they have a website. <laughs> Great. That's awesome. Yeah. So like the idea is we are we are kind of haunted by our own past. The first thing this, I guess to really think about is, you know, one, for example, one common aesthetic image in Vaporwave is Windows 95. The thing about Windows 95 is you can't talk about it anymore the way uh, that is being talked about it right now. Like to talk about Windows 95 in 1995 is fundamentally different than talking about it in the year 2020. And you, you know, in a sense, think about because in 1995, it was new, it was the next big thing. But in 25, you know, 25 years later, Windows 95 is, of course, an obsolete technology and uh, wrapped up in nostalgia. So that's sort of one important aspect of ontology is that, you know, even if you use the you can never recreate uh, a certain cultural moment in time, you no matter how much you want to. Uh, So by referring to the past, you're actually saying something different. You're not saying what, you know, what Windows 95 meant back then. Now you're saying what, whenever you say Windows 95, you're talking about what it means right now. Mm -hmm. And that's why these sort of references to anachronistic, you know, obsolete technologies are so, is so important to it, to Vaporwave, because Vaporwave is sort of us being haunted by our past and also futures futures that never existed but were kind of promised to us in some sense i was yeah. kind of thinking about that because mm-hmm. there's sort of two two versions of promised futures in a somewhat depressing way is that there's the actual one that i think about of like uh, we're both in the u.s so this is very u.s based politically mm-hmm. but in terms of stuff like social programs like healthcare. Mm-hmm education reform and affordability, like all this stuff that I actually wanted that I feel is in some sense lost or severely delayed. But there's, there's the other like retro future technology side of stuff of 
you know, where's my flying car? I was supposed to have a <laughs> robot butler in my Mars colony mm -hmm. by now. But that's sort of interesting because it almost comes from media itself. There's no at no point did a, a U.S. politician stand up and say, I will promise to the American people robot butlers and flying cars by 2005, right? It almost just became we saw these things in sci-fi and in media and wanted them. Mm -hmm. And then sort of absorb that into the culture where saying, where's my flying car became a joke, referencing that joke of where's my flying car. The, the flying car aspect is sort of like implied because of capitalism will mean progress in science and technology and things will get better and cheaper forever. And that's sort of was the implicit assumption about like pretty much every every bit of fiction about the future is that things would get better and better, at least technologically speaking. And so it was inevitable that we would have flying cars. Now we've, especially, you know, you mentioned the end of history. Mm -hmm. Ever since the Soviet Union's over, the bad guys have been defeated. There's nothing to do but lay back and just have a great life. Things are going to get better and faster and cheaper forever. That was totally the 90s vibe, right? You know, like the Clinton economy and all. We're just mm -hmm. chilling back and watching the numbers go up. And there's literally <laughs> nothing to worry about. I mean, there were problems, but they were problems that could be solved by personal choice you know environmentalism was a matter of recycling mm -hmm. and being conscious and racism was a matter about personal action and responsibility and like being able to accept others for who they are in all forms of bigotry like the idea of systemic racism was not like something people were ready to accept in the 90s yeah i mean it's easy now in in social media but back then if you were a, a marginalized voice it was very hard mm -hmm. unless you were extremely bombastic or popular mm -hmm. to make people realize all the problems so it's sort of you know it's tongue-in-cheek talking about the clinton era because it was really just chill and hang back for a kind of a subset of the population and everybody else still had the same shit going on so culturally i think that's sort of the appeal of vaporwave there's an interesting discussion to be had, I think, between the differences between synthwave and vaporwave. But I think, at least to me, the sort of most personal or the most the, the, the biggest difference between them is synthwave is we were promised a future that was cool mm. and we want that. So we really love the 80s coolness. Then vaporwave is we were promised a future that was safe. All problems were problems of personal alienation. It was because we were latchkey kids and like we were going to be home alone or like we, our friends didn't accept us or we we're going to have a job and an office, everything from being home alone to fight club. And <laughs> that was as bad it was going to get. But like to a lot of people, that's boy, that would have been great. Wouldn't it have been like yeah. you, you weren't yeah. going to face the climate apocalypse. You weren't going to face political catastrophe and crisis after crisis. We're kind of, I, I think uh, people who are interested in Vaporwave are in some level both wanting and also pissed or anxious about it that we, we aren't give we weren't given that. Uh, we're given what we have right now. No, I think saying the future that is safe is really great wording. I, I really like that because it is so different from the, like you said, synthwave outrun mm -hmm. kind of, of like i'm just gonna hop in my cool laser car <laughs> and drive down the laser roads as laser yeah. palm trees mm -hmm. blow past without a worry um that yeah. is that is interesting i like that phrasing a lot i mean also if you look at it like synthwave is definitely what i would call mark fisher's nostalgia mode and ghost of my life in the opening essay which is sort of the man i wouldn't say manifesto but kind of like Summary, if you just had to read 30 pages of Mark Fisher, that would be the 30 pages I would recommend. <laughs> he references Frederick Jameson. Uh, and so actually it's Frederick Jameson who references nostalgic mode, but Fisher applies it to uh, music specifically. And so his reference is the Arctic Monkeys, which uh, had a music video that was basically like almost identical of a uh, earlier era of British pop music. And so... His quote here, uh, Jameson's nostalgia mode is better understood in terms of formal attachment to the techniques and formulas of the past, a consequence of a retreat from the modernist challenge of innovating cultural forms adequate to contemporary experience. So I bet you look good on the dance floor. If you look up the video for that, for the Arctic Monkeys, it looks like something that came out of the early 1980s. And he specifically mentions being broadcast on the old gray whistle test in 1980 so again i'm not familiar with british pop culture from that era but like 
if you look at it, it very it, it has a very specific retro look. It's very just like, let's make it look like they use sophisticated video editing and filters to make it look like that. It's staged like a, a, a garage band in like a community center, uh, essentially. And uh, Synthwave is the same way. They They unapologetically love the synthesizer techniques and technology uh, of the 1980s you know the john carpenters and every other action movie uh you know commando etc and they want to replicate that but if you look at vaporwave vaporwave isn't nostalgia mode in that sense because they're distorting they're using plunderphonic techniques it's like taking that source material taking that sort of era of music and then mutating it uh in a sense like there's there's a uh, there's a lot more experimental work being done, but you you can't find vaporwave music that exists pre two thousand eight because no one took Diana Ross and slowed it down and made it music uh, exactly. That's kind of I think the difference between synthwave and vaporwave, which again connects to ontology. Yeah, absolutely. We'll include a, a link to that video in the show notes if other people want to check it out. Yeah, I think that definitely does capture because ontology, and we'll talk about vaporwave and other genres on the show specifically but like as a critical analysis tool hauntology applies to pretty much any form of, of media mm-hmm. you can probably do a hauntological reading of most stuff made in the past 20 or 30 years yeah uh in fact mark fisher then mentions a movie uh called body heat which was made in uh 1981 but it feels like it was made like as a 30s mm. uh noir movie kind of so yeah like movies tv anything that was basically like oh it's like we made it using production techniques from 30 years ago but n- now it's we just kind of updated in a few ways yeah that'll give me a chance to shout out my favorite movie of all time the 1993 classic oops, same year specters of marks interesting sneakers which is a 93 <laughs> computer caper but basically with robert redford and it's almost has the same energy as like a 70s post watergate spy thriller yeah seven days of the condor kind of vibe yeah exactly mm-hmm yeah, exactly. So uh, uh, this is sort of endemic to pop culture in general, is it? Especially, Mark Fisher basically uh, uh, says that it, this is because of capitalism uh, uh, is sort of feasting upon itself, uh, and uh, uh, since the end of the Cold War, we've run out of new ideas. Uh, in fact, there aren't supposed to be new ideas because everything's supposed to be the same forever now. That's right. I mean that that, that might be a simplification, but I, that was kind of the vibe I was getting from my reading of Fisher. No, I think that's that's right, because you want to make stuff that's easy to resell to people. Mm-hmm. People like their memories. And I think it's important to note that this really goes beyond, to me anyway, the normal, oh, it's just that 20, 30 year nostalgia cycle. Mm-hmm. Like, I think that's related. But when you talk about something like in the hauntological sense, there's a much deeper, deeper emotion evoked through the use of nostalgia in terms of really, really trying to pull people into a past and often a past that never really existed. Yeah, no, for sure. Yeah, nostalgia mode is uh, uh, one thing, but like, again, Vaporwave is doing something different. But for me, it was uh, uh, quite the experience to uh, before in the before times, uh, I went to Australia to uh, visit my partner, Maddie, and she was working at Fringe, which is a live performance festival, which they had thousands of shows spread over a month over different venues of like circus and stand up and you know theater but they also had a lot of live music all of this music almost all of it was all they were all cover acts uh they were singing specifically very 90s and early 2000s stuff there was an amy winehouse tribute show it was regularly sold out there was uh, an entire band that just did acapella covers of 90s pop music and uh or and early 2000s stuff you know the backstreet boys and nsync and kiss from a rose uh and they're very talented singers it was a very entertaining show but like these were just packed with people that seeing that and just like uh, uh there were a few shows that offered original music but they weren't nearly as popular usually they were they were in smaller venues more experimental so the, it all comes back to the question why is vaporwave different than all of this and why are we attracted to it uh, so i think what's interesting is that while there's this very interesting large social analysis you can do we're a music podcast we talk about haunted genres of music we've done it a lot so far so I've, I've sort of isolated ways that I think um, this really plays into how the music is produced. So one, which is the easiest because we've sort of already done it, is just the aesthetics, mm-hmm. right? Just the, the imagery, the iconography of something like Vaporwave, that 80s, 90s, like you said, Windows 95, 80s style cars, 8 and 16-bit images and sounds. 
a big one is just formats that we used to consume media on that don't exist really anymore, like VHS, although you have a very nice VHS collection, mm-hmm. which kind of is on brand for us, I suppose. <laughs> But there's also worked into that, you know, activities. So we did a whole episode on Mallsoft, which is just about, wasn't it neat to used to be able to go to stores? Mm -hmm. Like that's the general premise of the genre is like, you used to be able to go to these halls of consumerism and just walk around and buy things. Yeah. And that's enough of a cultural memory, enough of a cultural implant that it became a whole goddamn genre. Yeah. And one of my favorite, one of my favorite genres too. So <laughs> maybe I'm the consumerist whore deep down. Uh, and that iconography, that sort of symbolism, because, yeah, it, 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 and specifically with Mallsoft, it's uh, memories of music that like it was familiar enough in, in the way it was produced that it was it wasn't like people weren't listening to this exact music, but it was still like, oh, I remember this, you know, because it still triggered those kind of memories. And the whole point of Mallsoft music is you're not it, it's kind of like if you look focus in on it, it just kind of blurs, you know, it just kind of. You, you, it's all, it, it's peripheral music. It's not music you're supposed to like do a deep, attentive listen to. Mm-hmm. It, it's, it's background ambient noise that is comforting. Yeah. So vaporwave is kind of like, I guess, trying to be an antidepressant, you know, an acoustic form in some ways. It's trying to, to uh, alleviate our anxiety. You know, it's interesting. One thing that I'm, I'm always been interested in is the, not just the 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 very obvious symbols of vaporwave, like you mentioned, the Windows ninety five, uh, various computers and video games. But there's a lot of symbols in vaporwave that have are kind of are very absurd or surrealist, like this the the bust of Helios, the Greek bust. Yes, a lot of abstract conceptual art, a lot of palm trees. Kind of makes sense. Kind of you know emphasizing the dreaminess or the the again you're going to be safe it's going to be great you're just on vacation for the rest of your life. It, it, looking at it from a hauntology lens, why do you think Helios has become such a, a prominent? Was it just because it was thrown on floral shops, you know, Macintosh Plus albums cover art? Or I have to imagine, and then that was so many people's. I don't know. Has it been absorbed into? Are we haunted by the spirit of Vectroid now? Because. <laughs> You put Helios on on an album and now we just see it everywhere. I don't know. Has Vectory ever talked about why? Like what led to that that album design? No. I, I mean I, I haven't asked. Uh, you know, Vectory, she does stream on Twitch. I should probably join in on uh uh and just ask her in chat, see if she uh responds or just Google some interviews. That 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 that's an interesting question for the future. But now that I think about it, maybe these are kind of related to like textbooks covers because there, there are a lot of textbooks from the late 90s early 2000s that have a very abstract design a lot of polygons yeah that's a really good call actually because there's a lot yeah. of educational material kind mm-hmm. of aesthetic in vaporwave i think that's where a lot of the the laser crossed lines and color choices always remind me of like middle school yearbooks yeah exactly middle school yearbooks yeah because it's safe no one's going to get offended by it so yeah. And then the aesthetic, of course, also branches into how stuff is made, mm-hmm. which I always think how how medium is produced sort of dovetails into its its meaning. So we can kind of discuss these in tandem. But of course, one of the defining aspects of Vaporwave is samples mm-hmm. and samples by the nature of their existence are designed, unless they're really, really mutated, are designed to invoke memories. And I think I've talked about this on the Echo Jams episode that uh, I think the particular processing in Vaporwave makes them feel more like songs stuck in your head. Mm-hmm. Well, there's another aspect to it as well. Uh, and Mark Fisher kind of characterizes this as the crackle. But that in Vaporwave, it's the distortion, the making it sound like it came from a VHS or a cassette tape or just a, a broken, half broken speakers and a mall in the distance in the case of mall solve. But there's always some sort of distortion. So it's never it's always a, a, a lo-fi grungy high uh, noise to signal ratio uh, a key element of ontology is that that is more authentic more real than the crystal uh pristine cd quality perfectly studio engineered uh nature of like pop music today like you know any pop song you listen to now is going to be perfectly engineered just the vocals are going to be absolutely perfect the nature of auto tuning actually is varies in terms of fads like it's uh music seems to be less auto tuned than it was in like the early 2000s but that's a that's a whole different discussion but i think the crackle and the loss uh, uh distorting these samples is sort of a 
key component to hauntological music, uh, at least in terms of vaporwave. I don't know. Um, do you think it's all music that's sort of hauntological or uh, just kind of vaporwave and maybe? I, I think in terms of the lo-fi aesthetic, I think that's unique to vaporwave and a handful of other mm-hmm. subgenres because I don't think that lo-fi aesthetic in the same way works its way into something like Vapor Trap. Mm-hmm. But Vapor Trap is still haunted by production techniques because like we talked about in the episode, it's very, there's like a lot of 808 focus Mm -hmm. and and older synth patches, older drum machines, uh, still bringing back memories, Um, but it's, it's less distorted. So I think that would be like an example. Yeah, that's a good example. Of course, I'm always reminded of the Brian Eno quote, and I think we've used this before (laughs) on the podcast, but it's such a good thing. Uh, whatever you find now weird, ugly, and uncomfortable and nasty about our new medium will surely become its signature CD distortion, the jitteriness of digital video, the crap sound of 8 bit. All will be cherished and emulated as soon as they can be avoided. It's the sound of failure. Uh, so much of modern art is the sound of things going out of control, of a medium pushing to the limits and breaking apart. I think that's sort of a key aspect. He wasn't specifically talking about hauntology, but you know, he's sort of one of the OGs of uh, ambient music and certainly an important influence on Vaporwave. And I I think when you're surrounded by it, it's going to work its way into all your thoughts. And like you said, we have used that quote, um, but I really, really love it. I I like it because it makes me think a lot about what what are some um, aesthetics of today Mm -hmm. that we preserve that'll move forward. So I imagine a song that's like vocal samples, but they're like Discord robot voices Mm -hmm. like when the voice servers mess up or something it's it'd be interesting to see the sort of like uniquely because one thing in the vaporwave is that a lot of the distortions and issues are are analog distortions they come from having a physical tape that's played at the wrong speed or Mm -hmm. like a dirty head reader yeah it's just physical objects wearing down but but digital distortion exists but it's very different like if you've Mm -hmm. ever seen digital static on cable Versus old, old analog ear static and stuff. Mm -hmm. So I'd be curious to see if some of these digital aesthetics of degradation beyond just like compression work their way into stuff in in 20 or 30 years. Yeah, no, that's true. I think we'll see that first in horror, like horror narratives of some kind, especially like a movie or TV show. I think we're already getting that a little bit because back in the 90s, Nick Cage made a movie called 8 Millimeter, which is Mm -hmm. about like a a very scary 8 millimeter uh, film because film at that point was so was so old and removed that it was anachronistic and scary. But then like 10 years later, you have Ring, uh, which is about a haunted VHS tape, maybe 10 years, five or 10 years after that. God, there were a couple of uh, horror movies about people on webcams and Skype uh, getting murdered by people. <laughs> and, yeah, that's true. Yeah, so I think we'll see more of that as we we go on. I mean, that 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 go, of course we are already kind of seeing that that folk genre of creepy pasta, like Ben Drowned, uh, Slender Man, and all these other things, sort of like taking current technology and making it creepy and haunted. By supernatural elements, not by our past or our future that we never got. Yeah, that's true. I guess some of it has worked its way into horror movies because, yeah, there is the whole one that what was the one that was entirely just on like Skype and Facebook Messenger? Yeah, that's the one I'm trying to think of. That, that was uh, it was like a slasher flick. It was uh, uh, there were two Unfollow or three. Unfollow or unfriend? Oh, yeah. Unfriended. Unfriended. Yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, <laughs> so. <laughs> Yeah, I, eventually there'll be a good horror movie about that uh, phenomenon, I imagine. Found footage is in itself a haunted genre because it's about like the unreliability of our you know, recording equipment. Mm-hmm. We can't get a perfect picture of what's happening because the, the camera is not objective. It is subjective. Yeah, and uh, going on, referring again back to Mark Fisher, haunting then can be construed as a failed morning. It's about refusing to give up the ghost. So it's a failed morning of like what we were promised going back to the, uh, uh, the idea of like, we were promised something better than what we got. Yeah. So for me, I think this kind of dovetails back into um, sort of three things that I was, I was thinking about that we've we sort of covered, but I'm mm-hmm. just going to explicitly ask you Ross. Mm-hmm. So the first is both in, you know, way back to Derrida and then through Fisher and stuff, there is a lot of discussion about disjointed connection to past and trying to evoke those. But I was wondering, has that sort of merged because we've become so media saturated that kind of remembering media is remembering the history of your past? Because a lot of historical elements are in vaporwave, like mm-hmm. the dot-com bubble burst, 
um, the development of the internet, mm -hmm. all this other stuff. It, it almost feels like the media has become the lens to view history instead of just being a historian. I don't know if that makes sense. Actually, refer like one one key element both Derrida and Mark Fisher refer to is uh, uh, the quote from Hamlet: "Time is out of joint." Mm. Um, and I think one of the reasons why hauntological hauntology, you know, the, this idea, this theory is so prevalent or like it helps explain vaporwave is because we no longer have a clear sense of historical progress. Like, especially for Americans, we had this idea of America is, you know, we, we're colonizing, we have it, we're, we're, our children would be better off than us. And we're going to defeat the, the Soviet empire. We're going to defeat the Soviet union, our great enemies. And so there's always been like this sort of in, in popular culture, this kind of clear narrative of like, we started here, we're going to end up here. But after the Soviet Union fell, that kind of un unwound itself. We're, we're just going to have late stage capitalism, which is not really as interested in providing a clear narrative for everyone involved. Things started unraveling, at least uh, in terms of that sense of progress, that sense of uh, uh, history. I think you're right. I think there is sort of this idea of, of only understanding uh, history and like our sense of where we are and where we've been through media rather than, you know, reading real history and, you know, rigorous academic study, mm -hmm. which has never been super popular in America and is probably less popular now than it's ever been because we have people inventing entire, you know, universes and mindsets that, well, with the internet, those, those kind of fringe ideologies have become so mainstream that it's never been easier to just take a bubble worldview and just be entirely ensconced in that bubble you know like oh if you're a flat earther you could surround yourself with other flat earthers and just consume flat earther media and just ignore everything else um which you couldn't really do back before the internet and in our current circumstances i think because you had to deal more with other people and you know what was called the mainstream yeah absolutely so then my other two sort of discussion points, I'm going to combine into one because I realized mm -hmm. one is sort of personal and, and leads into the other. So thinking a lot about kind of my response to Vaporwave and, and this topic, I sort of realized that to me, a lot of repetitions in song started to feel like that repetition in samples started to be sort of a mental repetition in terms of anticipation. Like how many times have I thought, even just in the last five months, like, oh, this is when things will turn around. Mm -hmm. This is when things will get better. And you're kind of caught in that like melancholy of the past and now i wonder am i in some state of like meta nostalgia or some weird nostalgia because i'm less nostalgic for the way things were and more like nostalgic for being nostalgic of things being good and looking ahead yeah so is there like a meta nostalgia for nostalgia yeah i think have we have we tacked on too many terms no 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 um for me, it's a little different. Like the way I perceive it is that I am nostalgic for a world in which I didn't have to worry so much about the world itself. My problems were personal, but I wasn't, I didn't like the world wasn't going to end at any given moment or about to collapse or slowly collapsing in front of my eyes. Certainly, you know, like I said earlier in the 90s, you could kind of like ignore that and yeah, I think, again, from an American's perspective, you know, 9-11 did change everybody's bubble and like realize, <laughs> hey, history is mm -hmm. still happening. We can't just worry about our own lives. Uh, sometimes something bad will happen that we have no control over or that is just beyond us. That idea that like when I was growing up, like I just had to worry about like my own personal future. I wasn't I, I wasn't like thinking, well, the world could collapse in my lifetime and society could collapse. Or who knows what will happen? I was pretty sure society and institutions and things were going to keep on keeping on. I think somewhere in the Mark Fisher books, he talks about how like people who are worried about certain things since the 70s or 80s are beginning to see them happen. So it's kind of, I think, related to that. So again, just we've been putting off major problems so long that now we're nostalgic for when we could just worry about our own personal alienation and isolation and late stage capitalism screwing us over on a personal level not yeah and also not just screwing me over but screwing other people over because you know i grew up in rural western maryland and didn't know about other people until i was like 18 and went to college yeah and now like i become you know now i'm hyper aware because i've so many friends that I, I dearly love mm -hmm. <laughs> that are just constantly under assault mm -hmm. nowadays. And it's just, yeah, it's a lot to process and think about. And yeah, 
it's torture to have even a shred of empathy yeah. in 2020. I mean, think of it. Uh, vaporwave really started getting taking shape uh, in the aftermath of the, the great financial crisis of 2008. Yeah. Then really took hold after it became clear that Obama was not going to, you know, change anything like he, he, he was just going to be a status quo president. So you, on one sense, you like uh, the Obama, pre- I don't think vaporwave would have happened without the Obama presidency. Because on one hand, Obama was very much, everything's going to be normal. Everything's going to be fine. The status quo. But if you had an ounce of awareness, you knew that things were, it was being papered over. Like Mm -hmm. our economy was kind of getting back, but it was never going to be like helping the normal people. And then, you know, the Republican party is becoming just publicly fanatical, you know, in, in its hatred. And you have, you know, for example, manifesting in, just weird racism like the birther issue Mm -hmm. remember birtherism (laughs) and then of course their their fanatical hatred of trying to give people health care through their opposition of the obamacare uh you know the aca and so things were normal but they weren't and this sort of like it's hard for anybody to kind of like express these mutually exclusive worldviews that things are okay and or things are definitely not okay and vapor is kind of the same thing it's music that is normal but it is not normal like it's the same thing that you've been listening to for decades but it's beginning to break down it's beginning to mutate and so maybe that's the appeal of it is that it's representing our inner land our our inner mindscape to some degree it's the same kind of psychic stress of being pulled in two different directions at once yeah boy that's depressing to think about hey better listen to some vaporwave what a, what a way to go out. But man, that's that's where it's headed. And we'll have to see where hauntology and sort of what cultural nostalgia does for us in, in 20 or 30 years and, and where we're at. But for listeners out there, so hauntology is, again, this this theoretical framework. It's not necessary to appreciate or like Vaporwave. But if you kind of want to, like, think about where it comes from, like what the appeal is, why did it did a meme essentially be, linger on and like become this niche thing that's pretty stable and actually flourishing i think there's a there's a lot of interesting vaporwave still being made uh, a lot of really cool stuff and uh which we will obviously review in the future yeah so it's it helps you appreciate it but it's not necessary so if this was i don't know too deep or whatever for episode let us know no, i think it's um even like i said earlier just as a lens for media analysis i think it's legitimately interesting even if you yeah um want to leave vaporwave pure in some sense so that you don't have to think about these things Uh, so we'll leave some show notes with like books and articles if you want to dig even deeper than than we could in 45 minutes or so yeah but like if you think about it all music is a reflection of the time it was made in yep and uh now that i think about it vaporwave is the perfect music for the obama (laughs) the obama era it's pretty inspired yeah, that or Hamilton. Oh no! <laughs> it's, I mean, that, that maybe those are the two polar opposites. You have Hamilton on top and vaporwave seething below, um, waiting to break out. All right. Well, it's been a good run. Ten episodes. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to admit it, but like there is there there have been you know fascist and right wing people who have you tried to co op vaporwave and make you know Trump wave and mm-hmm. fascist wave and that kind of thing why they use vaporwave over synth wave although they probably use both but like I only heard about the vaporwave stuff is because again it's a reflection of people wanting a future or people mourning a future that was supposed to be safe and what is fascism is like people who are scared and want to be safe again or are willing to hurt other people and to dehumanize other people in order to be safe I mean that's I think that's an appeal of it so exactly and you know for a lot of people their idealization of what was good about the past is unbelievably gross yeah exactly it's something to think about but yeah uh, listen to vaporwave because you're you, you got to deal with that the, that inner stress somehow and uh what better way to listen to that mall music but yeah thanks for listening to this episode you can find us at night clerk radio on twitter i am at ross payton on twitter and i am at burke mcbergenson uh, next week, we're going to get back to just talking about two albums. So I think one of the pillar genres is dark ambient. So that's going to be the first one that we revisit in some sense. So we're going to be discussing two, I think, more recent dark ambient albums. Mm-hmm. One inspired by Lynch, my favorite. <laughs> um, and the other one is actually from The Caretaker, who is mentioned in uh, Mark Fisher's book. But we're going to see... The caretaker's new work. And who is the caretaker? Well, you'll have to listen to the next episode if you don't already know. So stay tuned to Nightclerk Radio. Nightclerk Radio.